Can one person's power over somebody else ever be an injustice all by itself? I mean, even if they don't do anything with that power. So if you were around yesterday, you know I think that we should say yes to that question. And in saying that, I am agreeing with the mainstream of what gets called Republican or neo-Republican political philosophy. Republicans insist that there's a kind of power that nobody should have, it's dominating power. And domination, Republicans say, is, is first of all, well, it's, it's a kind of power. It's about what you can do to someone, not what you actually do. It's not about actions enabled by the power, it's about the power itself. So, a nice little slogan, if you're dominated, or domination, for domination, not using it isn't losing it. Now, this claim about dominating social power has, has come in for a lot of, of criticism. And I mean, that's because, I mean, you know, if dominating someone is a kind of injustice, right, and, and domination is about what I can do, instead of what I actually do, then it's, it's possible to be complicit in an injustice without, you know, without doing anything. And, and maybe that's just too weird. I mean, also, if we allow even unwielded kinds of, of power to, to count as domination, well, maybe that lets like a thousand false positives bloom. Or, I mean, maybe not a thousand, but like a lot, right? It will end up diagnosing as domination all kinds of social phenomena that just, that just aren't, that we really shouldn't worry about. Now, what I want to do is, is show that, that thinking of domination as a kind of even unexercised power and, and a power that nobody should have survives these criticisms. And, and to do that, what I first want to do is discuss, well, what I think is the best reason to agree with the Republicans. And that'll show us you know, what critics of domination as this power have got to, to talk us out of. And then I'm gonna address uh, the serious objections to what I'm calling domination as power. And constructing an adequate response is gonna make us pay closer attention to, to how we, we come to have social power over other people. And that's gonna come in the third section of the paper. And then finally, I'll, I'll try to show how this closer attention to the workings of, of social power gives some, some aid and comfort to this basic Republican idea that domination is power. All right, so first, why think that the Republicans are right? What's the best reason to agree with the Republicans that domination is power? And I mean, the basic reason I canvassed yesterday, it's just that, look, I mean, if, if your options are A, an affectionate, gentle, lazy slave master, and be a mean, harsh, active slave master, then, I mean, obviously, right, you pick A. I mean, this was A, right, over here? Yeah, you pick A, that's just obvious. But, I mean, slaves have typically wanted emancipation if it's on the menu, if it's available, if that's one of the options, then that's what you want. I mean, if you, if you have to stick with a, if your only choice is a sort of nicer slave master, then do that. But that's not, not what you ultimately want as a slave. And I don't know that we can make sense of that desire unless we admit that slaves typically object to the kind of power their masters have, and not just to the particular ways that masters use their power. So if you think that slaves have a legitimate complaint against masters, I mean as masters, even against unactive, inactive, masters, then, then I think you got very good reason to think there's a kind of power that nobody should even have. And to me, at least, the point of theorizing domination is to get as clear as we possibly can about what this kind of power is like. And of course, not only slaves count as its victims. There are other obvious examples, um, subjects of, of tyrants, women under patriarchy, uh, black Americans, uh, Africans under Jim Crow, apartheid. It seems like in each of these cases, the domination complaint is not only against the active misuse of power, but against a kind of vulnerability to empowered others. And so vitally, I mean, if we endorse a view of domination that says that 
empowered parties can stop dominating just by a kind of self-regulation of their powers, then, well, I think we're not going to see the whole story of what the paradigmatic victims of domination legitimately resent about their, their situation. Now, there are a lot of theories of what domination is out there in the literature. Um, I think the, the best ones, I mean, the one that I have endorsed, <laughs> uh, identifies uh, a domination with a kind of uh, discretionary power to impose, right? A, and for practical purposes, we can possibly just say a kind of discretionary power to compromise basic interests that, you know, if, if I can compromise your, your basic interests, right, so if I can compromise your bodily integrity or the, the, the safety of your person, and your dependents, your access to medical care, then I can attach such costs to your refusal to cooperate with me that I can indulge in a robust confidence that you'll do what I say pretty much no matter what I say. But there are some apparently really damaging counterexamples to this idea that that's what domination is, that it's a kind of discretionary power, even unused. And I'll, I'll try to present these, um, well, I'll present the counterexamples as a series of, of vignettes, and they're on the, the back of the handout. So here's the first one. It's inspired by some worries from uh, Marilyn Friedman. I call it the strong woman. Maxine has really superior physical strength and fighting skills. She can beat up any of her neighbors. Even so, she doesn't. She's actually very gentle. But Maxine's neighbors get worried about how powerful she is. They circulate a petition to get the local government to force Maxine to take pills that weaken her so she's not a threat anymore. It looks like Maxine's got domination suited power. I mean, power enough to beat up anybody around you. I mean, that's power enough to compromise basic interests. But still, you know, a state that, you know, got busy punishing people for such unexercised powers, making them take pills to be weaker. I mean, that's undesirable by, I mean, anybody's lights as far as I know. I mean, Maxine's neighbors should not get their way. But doesn't that mean that there's nothing wrong with Maxine having the power she has? I mean, how can you admit that and keep thinking that, that power alone can dominate? All right, so another vignette, also from Friedman, at least inspired by some of Friedman's worries. Call it rural doctors. Justine is a faculty advisor at a medical school. She always makes sure to sit down and have a chat with every graduate in class. Look, she says, lots of rural areas are underserved by medical professionals. There's real need there. But there's a tragic moral quandary you have to think through very carefully. Your medical training gives you a skill set that can be used for good or ill. The knowledge of how to cleanse a wound brings with it the knowledge of how to infect a wound. The knowledge of pharmacology brings with it the knowledge of how to heal and how to poison. If you become the sole doctor in a rural area, the locals will have no choice but to seek out your care when they need medical attention. They are thus deeply vulnerable to your powers. And that's an injustice. And therein is your dilemma. You must choose between leaving rural communities underserved by medical professionals or dominating the same rural communities. Now, Justine, it's a good cause, maybe, but she's plainly overzealous. I mean, a doctor who moves to a rural community, I'm happy to say, I mean, they represent an unvarnished boon to that community, right? I mean, even though it's true that, that someone who can most skillfully infect your wounds or poison you has you know, power enough to, to compromise your basic interests. All right, one more vignette. Call it the confidant. Chad and Deb are dear friends. Sometimes when Chad needs to get something off his chest, he gives Deb a call and they talk it out. Chad tells Deb his deepest, darkest secrets. He tells Deb secrets he'd be horrified if anybody else knew. But he trusts Deb, and it means a great deal to Deb that he can confide in her. Their friendship is valuable to Chad in large part because he can trust Deb with the deep and the dark. All right, so if, if Deb knows Chad's 
darkest secrets. She's got a great deal of apparent power over him. I mean, after all, like in a flurry of, of tweets, right, she could ruin his life. I mean, just put all his deep and dark secrets out there. I mean, she could attach costs like abject humiliation to Chad's refusal to, to go along with pretty much anything that she wants. But if we say that, that Deb thereby dominates Chad, I mean, it seems like we're committed to saying, at least if we think that domination is a kind of injustice, that she sort of is involved in an injustice against Chad by being the best friend that he has. And that just seems obviously to be a terrible thing to think. So for all the above, it seems like denying that you can dominate someone, that you can have an unjust form of power over them, and that's what domination is. That seems like the obvious fix, right? That you, you should stay in, if, you, if you're moved by these, these cases, it seems like you should just say, well, look, you, you just don't dominate someone anytime you're stronger than them or anytime you have expertise they depend on. You've got to actually use that power in, in bad ways. And the having of it can't be dominating, at least if domination is something to be worried about. All right, so what are we going to do with cases like one through three here? the strong woman, rural doctors, the confidant. I mean, at least if we want to preserve the idea that domination is a kind of power and that you can dominate someone even without taking advantage of the power that you have. Well, I think there's something we can do, but to do it, we're going to have to get clearer about what it takes to have power over others. On the, the classic Weberian conception of, of social power, you've got social power when you can get other people to do what you want, even when they don't want you to. Now, we just can't track how much power you have just by considering you in isolation from your social context. That's the primary thing I want to emphasize right now. So if we want to know like, how effectively you can, as Weber said, you know, carry out your will despite resistance, we need to know more than just how strong you are, or how expert in medical science, or how knowing of secrets. We've got to know also what kind of context you're in in which you might use those resources. So social power, Frank Lovett puts it this way, it's not something you can reduce to its material bases. We've got to know what you're up against, right? We've got to know, I guess more precisely, I mean, whom you're, you're up against and what they're empowered to do to you by way of resistance. So when we talk about if you have power enough to compromise basic interest or power enough to impose your will, we're not just talking about things you can do. We're talking about the power of agents in the neighborhood. Republicans, I think, aren't always as explicit about this as they might be, but their talk about powers or, or capacities, I think, presupposes a kind of assessment of what we could call deployment costs. So, for example, physical strength enough to beat up your neighbors is not going to show up on a scan for social power. I mean, unless we factor in the costs to you of beating up your neighbors. So if your sole source of employment is you know, mowing your neighbor's grass, then you can beat them up only at the cost of losing your job. And two people who are possessed of exactly the same amount of physical strength are not going to have the same social power if one of them depends on her neighbors for employment and the other has no such dependence. Now, if domination is a kind of social power, this, this obviously matters to how we think of, of domination. So, I mean, remember the paradigm uh, dominators, right? The slave masters, the despots, the patriarchs. The master dominates his slaves, at least in part, because he can deploy his resources to secure their cooperation without, without the risk of, of incurring costs even remotely comparable to what he would lose if he stopped exploiting them. Now, obviously, I mean, wielding his power involves some cost to the slave master. I mean, maybe he can't beat people without breaking a sweat. I mean, maybe he can't sell a slave down the river without upsetting his children who are fond of the slave, right? But I think it's fairly obvious that from his perspective, 
those are costs that are at least relatively easy to bear. And this shows us, I think, something very important about when resources, so strength or social standing or whatever, can be cashed out as dominating social power and, and when they can't. And it puts us in range of a kind of principle to figure out what costs we got to attach to the flexing of your capacities to prevent them from showing up as, as domination. So, so here's the principle. It's in section, section three on the handout. So if the resources A might use to secure B's cooperation can't be deployed without incurring costs comparable to the cost involved in losing B's cooperation, those resources are not a basis for social power over B. We deploy resources, right, like strength or, or smarts to, to get other people to cooperate with us because their cooperation is valuable to us. And passing up the chance to, to secure their cooperation represents a loss. I mean, the, the loss of, of whatever it is that you hope to get through their cooperation. Now, in order to keep someone from turning their resources into power over someone else, you've got to, to make the cost of deploying those resources high enough to motivate the potential power wielder to accept the loss of you know, getting whatever it is they wanted from the cooperation of the other agents. So, I mean, how do you make sure that the resources that some A might otherwise use as social power can't be deployed without incurring sufficiently costly costs? Well, I mean, one way to do it is to make sure that B, or maybe some other third party acting on B's behalf, has power over A. So if A can't attempt to penalize B for their non-cooperation without risk, you know, for example, of, of going to jail, of some C tossing them in prison, and that's usually gonna make the cost of flexing their resources costly enough that, you know, they'll stomach the loss of whatever it was they hope to get from B's cooperation. But notice, right, that if, if B or, or if some C on B's behalf has got power to prevent A from having power over B, that that's, that's about attaching cost to the deployment of their resources to penalize non-cooperation. Non it's not about penalizing having the resources themselves, right? So when we say that you know, the, the muscle-bound lawn worker doesn't have power over me, we don't have to make them less muscle-bound. We can just make sure that there are costs in place to certain uses of their musculature. So it's not obvious why that's important. Hopefully it'll be obvious real quick. All right, so given what I just said, I hope this much is clear. We just don't know. I mean, we don't know how much power you have over someone else unless we know what it costs you to use your resources to control them. So what I wanna do now in conclusion is show, I think, how this might affect our verdicts about the proposed counterexamples. Let's start with Maxine. So in the idiolect that I've already introduced, she's got a great deal more of a, what we can call a particular material basis for social power than her neighbors have, given her, her strength, her, her combat prowess, right? So does it follow that they have a domination complaint against her? Well, not necessarily. I mean, that she's stronger, that she's a better fighter, won't mean that she dominates them as long as it's sufficiently costly for her to try and get her way around town by, you know, beating people up. And, you know, an effective police presence might just give her neighbors access to enough power that she doesn't dominate them. And it suddenly doesn't, I think we can see now why her, it's not necessary to make her physically weaker to avoid domination. It's not the resource we penalize, it's the way that resource is activated that we have to penalize. So all told, I don't think there's any reason to think that conceiving of domination as an even unwielded social power is gonna force us to say that the mere fact of unequal strength or smarts indicates that there's domination. You can make it costly for someone to 
to use their resources to punish others without you know, punishing them just for having the resources. And I think the Maxine case too, it brings to light something that we really should notice about the, the location of, of domination complaints. So given that whether or not you have social power is a function, at least in part, of your context, not just of your sort of raw abilities or capacities, the domination complaints are not always properly aimed at you know, the agent with the abilities. Right, so I mean, if Maxine, you know, gentle as Maxine is, if she lives in a place where there's no effective police presence, that's not her fault. I mean, it's not like there's much that any one person can do to sort of summon an effective police presence. So, I mean, it might be that in that case, without sort of effective ways to check her abilities, that Maxine does dominate her neighbors, but it's not gonna be her fault. So there might actually be a domination complaint, but it would not sort of be properly aimed at Maxine. So we should recognize, I think, that to dominate and to be the proper target of a domination complaint, they don't always sort of walk along the same way. And that, saying that represents a change of mind for me. That's not what I used to say. All right, so what about Justine? What about Justine's charges, the, the newly minted MDs. Was she right to think that if they take their medical skill to an underserved part of the world that they just kind of introduce a new injustice, even if, you know, it is good for a doctor to be there? Well, to see why not, I think let's, it, it can help to think through a case where maybe a, an isolated doctor, I mean, might dominate. So imagine, you know, I'm the only accessible doctor and imagine that you'll die without my care and imagine there's like no local law enforcement whatsoever and imagine that I don't have to submit to any professional oversight whatsoever and I'll lose no business if I neglect you and nobody else cares if you live or die and nobody's going to notice either way. I mean it seems like to me in a case like that it's plausible to think that I do dominate you I mean, you might be glad that I'm around, right? I mean, you might be glad that I'm around because you'd rather live than die, but you know, that doesn't tell us a lot. I mean, a slave might, who might starve if they weren't enslaved might be glad they're enslaved, but that doesn't tell us really anything about you know, whether they're dominated or not. It just shows that they had a really bad choice situation. And the same could be true with this isolated patient, right? Rather live than die, and so, they put up with it, right? I mean, there are other evils in this world, I think, than domination, and there's no guarantee that being dominated is always the lesser of the two. But if I dominate in that sort of alternate scenario, it's not just because of my medical skill, right? It's not just because of what I know how to do, right? It's gonna, because, it's gonna be because there are insufficient costs, or there's no cost at all to certain ways that I might turn those skills into social power. So the capacity to, to clean someone's wound might be the same as the capacity to infect it and the capacity to climb, to help someone climb the stairs might be the same capacity to throw them down the stairs as, as Friedman says. But that's only if we're talking about the material basis for social power. And that's not always to talk about if we wanna figure out what domination is and why it's an injustice. So if we're talking about your power over others, well, it's gotta be that we think about what it costs you to do those things. And if there are second or third parties around who can make it very costly for you to infect wounds instead of clean them or to push someone down the stairs instead of helping them up the stairs, well, then those two capacities are not gonna be the same. So you'll have the capacity to infect a wound only at a significant price, where you have the capacity to, to clean a wound without that price, without that cost. Now, Friedman actually recommends that we think in exactly this way. She just believes that, you, that it's inconsistent with thinking of domination as a power, and I hope that I've shown that we don't have to agree with her about that. All right, finally, what about the confidant? And here, here again, I think that once we understand how to sort out the social powers agents actually have, we can 
uh, avoid the nasty sort of intuition that we had earlier. So for starters, I mean, think about this, right? I mean, I think this is a bit of common sense, but it is, there's a kind of foolishness in telling your deepest, darkest secrets to a stranger. That you, you're taking a risk in telling your deepest, darkest secrets to a stranger that's unwise in a way that it's not to tell your deepest, darkest secrets to a close friend. And it seems like the reason for that is captured in some of the things that I've tried to say about social power. That when you, when you tell your deepest, darkest secrets to a total stranger, you, you give them a kind of power over you that you don't give to the deepest, darkest secrets when you tell them to your trusted friend. And that's just because the cost involved in telling other people your deepest, darkest secrets and casting them out before the waiting Twitterverse, the costs are just not the same for the stranger as they are for your dear friend. So the stranger can cast your deepest, darkest secrets out to the wolves of Twitter without sort of losing anything that they care about. But that's not the case with the trusted friend. So the trusted friend can do the same thing, has the same sort of raw ability to throw your secrets out to the, the waiting internet, but they don't have the ability to do that without losing something that they care about, namely your friendship. So while the raw ability might be the same, again, I don't think they both scan in the same way as social power. There are costs attached to the friend betraying you that just aren't there when you tell your deepest, darkest secrets to a stranger. And also, of course, I mean, if, if, if Deb goes out and tells a lot of people that all of Chad's deepest, darkest secrets, well, then that's going to give Chad this ability to tell everyone that Deb's the kind of person that tells the deepest, darkest secrets of her closest friends. And that's not, I think, an inconsiderable social pen penalty. All right, so in each of these cases, I think once we think a little clearer about how social power works, we, we can see that saying that domination is a kind of power, that it's a kind of power nobody should have, doesn't commit us to saying anything that's obviously out of step with, with good sense. That maybe we can't, I don't know, we can save the intuitions, we can at least salve the, the intuitions, and maybe that's good enough. All right, thanks. <laughs>